from the dark recesses of my unconscious mind into the glaring light of objective reality. You are listening to the Dark Mind Podcast. Friends and familiars, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Dark Mind Podcast, where we explore the boundless realm of dark literature and film. On today's show, we have a writer and a pioneer of the genre of Afrofuturism. Her speculative fiction is dark, chaotic, beautiful, tragic, and sometimes humorous. She's joining me today to talk about her new short story collection entitled The Wishing Pool and Other Stories, as well as her upcoming work. So without further ado, join me as we delve into the dark insight of Tanana Reeve Du. Tanana Reeve, welcome to the show. Hi, glad to be here. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me on this fifth day of May 2023, also known as Cinco de Mayo. I read your collection of short stories, The Wishing Pool and other stories, and was really struck by the way you slowly wove a feeling of dread into the narrative. What really affected me was how, in many of the stories, you brilliantly painted the ending with specific but somehow ambiguous strokes, which the reader would then be forced to fill in with the product of their own anxious suspicion. So I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be on the show. So right off the bat, we have the title story, The Wishing Pool, which juxtaposes elements of the wonder of childhood with the harsh realities of adulthood and the aging process. Mm. The story deals with the heartbreak of dealing with a loved one that has dementia and is losing their memory of their family members. And you've dealt with dementia with regard to your own father in real life. Did you write this story for a sense of catharsis? And if so, what conclusion was the end of the story meant to cement in the reader's mind? Well, I wrote The Wishing Pool when I was anticipating a visit to my father in Atlanta. He lives with my sister Mm -hmm. after COVID. So I hadn't seen him in at least a year and a half. And we were planning a family visit, maybe two years, you know how it was. <laughs> and we were planning a family visit and I just didn't know what to expect. I mean, I keep in touch with him, FaceTime and phone calls and now Alexa, which is a lot better because it's a standing camera and you can just be with each other. You don't have to talk all the time. But at the time, I didn't know what to expect. And I had a deadline coming up, as always, when I have a deadline for a horror story. I asked myself, well, what are you afraid of right now? And I was afraid of losing my relationship with my father and losing my father. So that's literally where the wishing pool came from, just me sort of trying to gird myself for this visit, not knowing what to expect. And it went way better, I would love to say. (laughs) Yeah, you (laughs) did mention that, yeah. It went way better than the visit in the story. And it turned out, I mean, even now, he's doing so much better than than the character in the story. (laughs) So I feel very lucky. Well, the next story, Haint in the Window, and I I think, am I pronouncing Haint right? Is that? Yes. Okay. Is about a man named Daryl that manages a bookstore who was born with psychic ability, which allows him to see into the mind of a racist security guard with an itchy trigger finger named Rick. And you mentioned how Rick is not a police officer because he probably didn't qualify for the LAPD. 
I myself worked with a guy like Rick when I worked for a private EMS service, and mm -hmm. I was in my 20s, so I was a little too naive to realize what a pathological liar was. He was probably about 10 years older than I was. Mm -hmm. So do you have any experience with a narcissist and or sociopath in personal life, like someone that you knew and had regular interactions with? And if so, were they the inspiration for Rick or any of your characters? Oh, um, my goodness. And, if, and uh, if, if so, could, goodness. could you tell us about them? <laughs> Holy cow. Thank goodness, no. Okay. Um, everything is vicarious <laughs> with me. So when I was a reporter, I was a reporter for the Miami Herald for 10 years. And I, you know, I don't know if this is about Rick. This I had forgotten his name was Rick. So thank you for reminding me of that. It's on his <laughs> name tag. But in terms of just dangerous people, pathological liars are, are scary, you know. And as a dating columnist, I interviewed a woman who was married to a pathological liar to the point where he pointed himself out on the bank's security cam, taking out money that he professed not to know how the money was leaving the account. They were investigating and they were pulling their hair out. And he pointed her to the footage just like it was him all along. So, no, I think that story is more in response to gentrification overall, which is where a lot of traditionally Black communities that had lower rents and often as a result of neglect, the houses in disrepair, you know, tenants wanting improvements but not getting them. But then when landlords decide they can raise the prices, give it a paint job and invite new people in, you see these changing neighborhoods. So this is a Black bookstore in a neighborhood that is shifting and is no longer the traditional Black neighborhood it was. And one of the stories I heard about this happening in Baldwin Hills was at a mall where a man was shot by security at the food court because one of the things that happens with gentrification, especially as it relates to policing, is that very often, not always, I do sometimes speak in generalizations, but I'll say sometimes, often, whatever phrasing works, police see themselves as protecting white people from Black people, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so... Like I said, that's not always the case. But when you have these shifts in neighborhoods, people who are in their own community can then be looked upon by police or even armed security guards, which is the case in this story, as a threat, as the other, as the person who is the one you're supposed to be keeping outside to protect property owners, to protect wealthier people uh, who often look white so or are white. So that's really what that's about. And it's also an homage in retrospect to Esowan Bookstore in Los Angeles, which just recently closed down. It was an independent Black bookstore. And really bookstores like Marcus Books in Oakland, which is still there, who were really, really important to me at the beginning of my career because those booksellers would hand sell my books to customers in a way you don't get at a chain store. So it was sort of a love letter to Black bookstores. Now, that's not the one that I just saw a video of that specializes in, I think, Afrofuturism. No, Octavia's Bookshelf just opened up in Pasadena. Yes, yes. Um, there's the Salt Eaters now in Los Angeles. So there are other bookstores taking up sort of the baton after SO1 left. But SO1 was pretty much holding it down by itself for a very long time. Okay. Yeah, and the um, the description in the story of gentrification, it's almost kind of like an occupying force. Unfortunately, it can look that way and it can feel that way to residents who now are suddenly being looked upon as strangers in their own neighborhoods. Well, the next story incident at Bear Creek Lodge is about a young boy named Johnny that's going to visit his grandmother, who was a famous actress in her younger years, while she's entertaining some celebrity friends of hers. Johnny's mother and uncle had little to do with his grandmother because, as it turns out, she was not the greatest mother. The story seems to be about familial trauma and abuse, but the end has a bizarre twist. <laughs> And I don't, so, and and I don't want to ruin that. Like, I don't, I don't know if you can do it without creating a spoiler. But if you can, I'm just dying to know what was the final scene meant to reveal. I will try to explain it spoiler free about about Johnny's grandmother's character and what made that woman tick. 
<laughs> I am actually writing a speculative script, which is basically a script for fun. You know, the Writers Guild is on strike, so I'm yeah. not uh, writing it for anyone but my own pleasure. But Incident at Bear Creek Lodge is basically the backstory to a contemporary creature story in the woods. You know, I've always wanted to write that, just a contemporary creature story with a Black family in the woods. And I'm writing that as a script. But Incident at Bear Creek Lodge is, is the backstory. And there are scenes in the script that are from the short story that try to explain, A, the relationship of this child to his grandmother, who he really doesn't know. And it's basically not the best introduction either. Uh, mm -hmm. She's sick when the story takes place. She's vain and she surrounded herself with the celebrity friends who will still socialize with her. But because she gained her fame in the 1930s and part of the 1940s, playing these very broad, comical Black characters that are often uh, dismissed as what's called cooning. You know, you're big, wide-eyed, open-mouthed, stereotypical, often you're playing a maid, because that was, you know, as Hattie McDaniel said, you could play a maid or be a maid. And she made her fortune pushing that stereotype beyond the time when it was comfortable, even for other Black actors in Hollywood. <laughs> so she became a bit of a pariah. And I think without spoiling it too much, the story is about what happens when one pariah meets another pariah and they form a bond in the woods. She, she had a nervous breakdown. She kind of spent five years by herself in that cabin. And while she was in that cabin, she made a friend. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and, and, and the friend she made serves as a, a metaphor for her trauma and the toxic intergenerational nature of her trauma, because I can't, ex she's a terrible mother, a terrible grandmother. She's abusive, basically mommy dearest kind of thing, which is why her own daughter won't even speak to her. But unfortunately does send her son to say goodbye when she gets sick. It seems like the only decent thing to do. And she set up some rules and she hoped it would go better than it did. And that really does happen when you send your children, even if you send them with family, or sometimes especially if you send them with family, things can and will go wrong if you are not there to personally supervise it. So basically, this story is a moment when that intergenerational pain, all that poison that that grandmother had to swallow, she could have been, like in the script especially, we get a bit better glimpse of her. She could have been like a Charlie Chaplin if she had not been a Black woman. So she had these great physical comedic skills, and she could headline a movie, but she could only headline the movie in a maze uniform, basically being laughed at, not with, mm, yeah. <laughs> by white moviegoers who, who, by and large, at that time, saw Black people as inferior, saw them as servile. And very limited in terms of what they can contribute. Yeah. Yeah. When I was watching the um, horror noir documentary, you know, I grew up, I was born in 1980. So I grew up in the 80s, but really wasn't allowed to watch much in the way of film. So it was the 90s when I really got into film. But watching the documentary with regard to black exploitation, I didn't even know that genre existed. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you had a real eye-opening experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was really interesting. Yeah, that was a shift. You know, the 70s were a shift. Uh, not all of them were good movies, and most of them were not produced by Black people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of um, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song by Melvin Van Peebles kind of opened the door to this Black exploitation era where producers and studios realized they could make money making films for Black people specifically. So you did have a lot of broad stereotypes in those movies, like the pimps and the costuming and the sort of overly macho male characters and overly sexualized women characters. But at the same time, there had been no macho and there had been no healthy sexualization <laughs> like almost <laughs> up to that point. Yeah. And, and that's the perfect kind of era that would have caused the grandmother in that short story incident at Bear Creek Lodge pain because it's very, very different than when she was in the industry. And as stereotypical as those roles might have been, at least they were powerful roles, whereas her role was at least visually a powerless role. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. I couldn't quite suss out because I'd never actually seen any of the films. I wasn't able to suss out whether... 
they felt that it was positive or negative, or maybe it's, it sounds like, I guess, a little bit of both. It, it was a mixed bag. It was, bag. there were positive aspects and there were definitely negative aspects, but I would argue it was better than invisibility, which is what a lot of black <laughs> er- characters had been uh, experiencing yeah. up until that point. Gotcha. Well, circling back to your book, the next story, Thursday Night Shift, a young woman named Shanna is sent a gift in the mail from her aunt that turns out to be a black stone. And the stone began to change and become a part of Shanna to the point that it was mimicking her emotional responses and affecting her consciousness. And uh, it was really surreal Uh, A really surreal story. The story takes place in the midst of the civil rights movement when a lot of protests were going on. So I was curious to know, was the stone meant in a way to represent Shanna's burgeoning awareness of herself and her situation within the movement? And if so, could you kind of expand on that? I think um, she's a relatively young uh, girl. I believe she's only in high school. And while the civil rights era, my parents included, was very fueled, it's not so much, I think, that she's seeing her place in the movement, but she's recognizing that she's in an important moment in history. And the story takes place on a very special night in 1968 that is still remembered and still mourned and is still seen as a huge turning point in race relations. So... It's one of those stories that is about like, what if you know your living history and you have the opportunity to change it? What is the cost? And I don't know if you caught it, and I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that the the reverend in that story is Martin Luther King. Oh, okay. So that is uh, an important day that that she is interacting with. Okay. Yeah, just with, well, I'm not going to reveal the end, but it doesn't quite end the same way. The, yeah, uh, it's a little bit differently in the yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, was there any kind of symbolism with the stone? I mean, as far as why you chose that medium? Not really. I was trying to think of something that could have been mailed to her from an exotic place. My aunt, like her aunt in the story, is has been a world traveler and would often send gifts. So with a fantasy premise. I wouldn't call this science fiction. It's science fiction E, But with that kind of a premise, you're always looking for what could sound credible as some kind of a conductor between civilizations. And I came up with the notion of a stone, which is basically here to collect information. That's all it does. It's a, a witness and collector for an alien race we know nothing about (laughs) that happens to be dug up at a dig, an archaeological dig, and ends up in her hands with some very unintended consequences. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, so the next series of stories in the book, and I guess I didn't preface this with everything is broken down into four sections, which I, I heard somebody aptly describe as like movements in a symphony. Okay. Yeah. That was the Washington Post. Oh, was it? Okay. I was gotcha. almost like, wow, yeah. really? Okay. Like, hell yeah. I'll take that all day long. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> well, so the next series of stories in the book is called the Gracetown stories. And I looked up Gracetown and the only one I was able to find was like in Western Australia. So I'm assuming your Gracetown is fictional. Is that correct? I'm glad you didn't find another Grace Town because <laughs> when I first started writing, I was a sort of a double major in journalism and English slash creative writing. And I read a lot of Faulkner. And he had this fictitious county called the Aknapatafa County, where a lot of his stories took place. And I wanted to create my own version of a Aknapatafa County. So I started writing these stories many years ago. Some of them appear in my first collection, Ghost Summer, which also takes place in Gracetown. But when I first started publishing them, I was calling it Graceville, Florida. And if you look that up, you'll realize there is actually a Graceville, Florida. And I was like, oh, no, I don't want to use a real town. My whole idea was that it was fictitious. So I changed it to Grace Town. And hopefully the good people of Graceville don't think I'm trying to describe their town as a terrible place uh, steeped in uh, racism where magic is real. 
But uh, that's what Gracetown is. And so I have a series of stories that take place there, often with characters, often with children, having interactions with various creatures (laughs) or (laughs) ghosts in Gracetown. Okay. Well, this is, I mean, up until this point, the stories have kind of been more on the emotional spectrum. This is where the stories start to get terrifying. <laughs> Thank y'all. <laughs> I do love a good creature story. And, you know, that's why I'm writing this creature screenplay. Man versus nature is one of my favorite themes in horror right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can definitely get that from some of the stories. The first one in the second section, last stop on Route 9, was Mm. (laughs) exactly, as I said, terrifying. I've talked with many authors about how isolation, especially in the context of being in in a rural area in the middle of nowhere, is great fodder for a horror story. So in the story, a woman named Charlotte and her 12-year-old cousin get lost on the way to a funeral luncheon. They end up in this very surreal world where it seems like their very presence has desecrated the memory of deeply entrenched racism. Mm. So was the story of Charlotte and Kai meant to be an admonition to stay on guard and not be complacent when it comes to that? And if not, can you kind of expand on that? That was kind of an expression of real life horror for a lot of black travelers, you know, Uh, You might remember that the opening of Jordan Peele's film Get Out has Lakeith Stanfield's character, Andre, wandering lost in a suburban neighborhood that we can assume is a mostly white suburban neighborhood. And he's scared. He's on his phone like, you know, I'm in the suburbs. You know, he's trying to make light of it, but he's scared. And with good reason, as it (laughs) as it turns out. And there have been a spate of news stories recently about people knocking on the wrong door, driving into the wrong driveway, where a gun-happy homeowner just shoots people for imagined transgressions that are really just, I'm lost, I need help, I'm in the wrong car, I'm in the wrong driveway, which is such a horrifying event. We've all experienced moments of being lost, but you don't often have to worry you're going to get shot when you get lost. But the genesis of the story, again, I was on deadline, and I was like, well, what What is scary to me, and I remembered a real life incident where my mother passed away in 2012 and on our way to the repast at a friend's house where they were going to serve food after the service, we got lost in a very rural North Florida road. And when we finally saw buildings, it's like a whole compound of several structures on the same property. We pulled into this driveway thinking, oh, thank God, people. But then we noticed flying on a huge flagpole. A Confederate flag. You, and I knew like, this was oh. going to a bad place when you used the word compound. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, this is that kind of compound. Yeah, that so kind we of just kind of went into reverse <laughs> and left, which are the characters also do in the story. You know, one of the things I like to do in my horror stories is replicate the behaviors that feel lived by many readers, but especially black readers who who don't necessarily feel that sense of curiosity. You know, like, huh, hello? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, whatever. Like, if I see something that doesn't look right, I'm going to reverse. I'm not going to open that door. I'm not going to answer that knock. I might not even pick up that phone. So, so much for that horror movie premise. (laughs) Because, (laughs) Because learning how to suss out danger and avoid it is a survival skill. That all marginalized people have to learn or they don't survive. And a lot of Black families have these intergenerational stories of being followed on dark roads and, and, you know, real life horrors that happen during Jim Crow and since, frankly. So I decided to take a title of a short story that I wrote in college called Last Stop and Route 9, which was a very different story. It might have been my first college publication, but during that time, I had not discovered myself as a genre writer And I had not discovered myself as a Black woman writer. So the literal story is a white man is driving on a deserted road and comes to a gas station. And over the course of the story, we learn that he's very sick. And that's the end of the story. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Kind of a tone poem. Kind of a, you know, literary style, low plot, just sort of atmospheric story. And when I look back on that era and all the, and that wasn't the only story I wrote with a white male protagonist or a white women protagonist. So when I look back on that era, when I was invisible to myself, 
not doing it to sell, by the way. It was completely unconscious, which is what made it so scary. I didn't even feel like I had permission to exist in my own work. So in the wake of Jordan Peele and Get Out and the awareness of Black horror, I wanted to write a story, which which I don't always do, where racism is the monster. Like Get Out is a movie where racism is the monster, but his other two films are not so much about that. And I'm thinking about this collection, I really can't think of another story, maybe hanging in the window a little bit, but where racism is the monster as much as it is in Last Stop on Route 9. And the premise of that story is, what if you got lost <laughs> on a magical road in Gracetown and you came face to face with like all caps racism? Like like the monstrous, like if it had some kind of a, a supernatural form, what would racism look and feel like as you're on that road? Mm, okay. And I'm I'm really detailed almost to a fault. So when I first read about you described as a writer of speculative fiction, and then I found your teaching a class on Afrofuturism, is one contained within the other? Like is one like a subgenre of the other? Can you kind of explain those two and if this particular story qualifies as one or the other? I identify Afrofuturism very broadly, so that it would be Black speculative art, right? Okay. <laughs> and by speculative, it's the not real. So it's an imaginary past, it's technological futures or imaginary technologies in the present, it's fantasy places, people and things, creatures, it's magical realism, and it's horror, because horror is often fantasy, because, sorry, vampires are not real. <laughs> Sorry for anyone who's convinced they are, but they just aren't real. <laughs> so that's fantasy. So that's, I think, to answer your question, speculative fiction uh, and Afrofuturism mean the same thing to me. They mean the Black speculative arts, including horror. Now, different people will have different definitions. And some people tend to focus on that term futurism. And they would say, well, if this is a contemporary story, that doesn't count. Because there's something uh, very interesting about it. Black speculative arts slash Afrofuturism, and that it really does hold the past, present, and future in a single space. We're living in this moment simultaneously. It really does invite us to sort of peel away barriers of time and barriers of imagination to imagine what if. And here's the world of this story where Black people exist in the past in a way that you were not used to seeing. Black people exist in the future in a way we never expected to see. And we're using this speculation like the late Octavia Butler did to hold up a mirror to our real society, our current society, and say, hey, we need to do better or we are headed for big trouble. Okay. Well, your next terrifying tale, <laughs> uh, Supper Time, was an intense <laughs> creature feature about Yay. a young woman named Matilda. Intense creature feature. Listeners at home, <laughs> I emphasize intense. <laughs> uh, this story really showcased the aspects of violence and indifference involved in nature, which I think you alluded to earlier. From the beginning scene of helping her father to slaughter a lamb, to Matilda's pet bobcat Bobby going from cuddly as a kitten to wild and violent as he grew into an adult... It made me think a lot about the behavior of human societies. So mm. I was curious to know if you think that sometimes we conflate technological advances with human progress. Are these technological advances helping us or making us more dangerous than anything you can find in the wild? That's so uh, interesting that you would phrase the question that way, because I interviewed Octavia Butler with my husband, Stephen Barnes, back in the year 2000. And she specifically talked about how our intelligence and our technologies are really sort of hastening our decline in some way. Our technological intelligence surpasses often our emotional intelligence. 
So it's like, no matter where we go, there we are, right? Hmm. So if I'm writing a story that's set 100 years ago, I don't have to sit and worry, like, what are people like? They were like us, except they didn't have, you know, as good health care, Lord knows. Thank goodness I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't have to <laughs> suffer through uh, medicine in the 1800s and early no. 1900s. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they're scared of the unknown. They're mistrustful of strangers. They love their families. They love their children very often. Uh, they will do anything to protect their families and their children very often. And if you just start with that piece, I mean, yeah, there's some hard fought gains that we've seen politically, but then you also see the setbacks that sound exactly like the kind of rhetoric that people used when everyone was afraid of communism in, in the 1950s, right? It's just, we're the same people. But now we have more dangerous weapons. Now we're creating AI, uh, frankly, that could go wild. We have no idea where the AI movement is heading. So I would agree with you. And it's interesting that you pick up on that because even though it's set in the past, supper time, it's set in like 1909 or I forget what year, early 1900s. There's a big emphasis that this child has on technology. She's enchanted by technology. She has this new camera that she's using, which revolutionized home photography. You know, uh, there's a thing, I don't know if you've ever seen these images, but in the Victorian era, like the early, early 1900s, late 1800s, that people would pose with their dead loved ones. Everyone would dress up and someone might be holding a a baby, but the baby's dead. Because very often, this was the only time they ever took a photograph. This is a way to remember that this person lived, this person existed. But then when you got these brownie cameras, and you could just send the film in and they would develop it, then uh, photography becomes a home hobby. And she's an early adapter. So even though the technologies will seem old and outdated to us, like she's looking uh it's, you know... um it's like slideshows and the camera and all this. She's got her eye on the future, but she's set in the past. And her technology, her use of technology is centering around her curiosity very often. And I think it's her curiosity and her Bobcat's curiosity that <laughs> get them in trouble in this story. <laughs> yeah. So I think there is a way of, I didn't intend it necessarily that way, but when you phrase the question that way, there is a way that you can look at sort of this being enchanted with technology is kind of a cautionary tale because it's not about whether the technology works or how great the technology is. It's how do you use that technology mm. and what does that technology invite into your life? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The, uh, hopefully nothing as bad as what came out of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I won't say any more. I don't want to spoil it, but good God, that was uh, that was some nightmare feel right there. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Maybe Absolutely. you didn't mean that as a compliment. No, no, no. That, tr it. No, trust me. If I if I am talking to a writer of horror and I tell them that their story freaked me out, that is nothing but a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. So excited. Well, coming up to one of my favorites. Your story, The Rumpus Room, mm. was one of my favorites because it's an example of how you imply what the ending is going to be. So you, in effect, terrify the reader with what they suspect the ending is going to be. And then they're left to fill in the details with whatever underlying fears they have floating around in their subconscious. Like you don't exactly explain the final results. So you're left to just fill in the blanks of like the most horrific stuff you can think of from, you know, reading true crime or, you know, whatever you have floating around in your subconscious. Yes, absolutely. Rumpus Room, and again, it's the deadline is approaching. Uh, I had to write a new story. You work well under pressure, collection. apparently. I do. That's my whole plan is deadlines. And rather than having to write two stories, this one was so long that I, I got to make it like, uh, actually, I was going to write three stories, but Rumpus Room was so long that I only wrote two new stories, which were Rumpus Room and the last story, the biographer. So in terms of my real life, I put myself through like quizzes, Right. So what's the real life horror of this story? And it really was the fungus in the shower, to be honest. And that's not too much of a spoiler to say that at some point in the story, there's this bathroom that has a bad smell where she's staying and she realizes there's a fungus growing in the shower. And a lot like her, like when I saw mine in real life, I didn't have my glasses on. I thought it was a washcloth that had fallen to the floor. So I nudged it with my toe and it was hard. And I was like, Ugh. what the hell is that? 
And it came out of nowhere. Like, I feel like it wasn't there the day before. Uh. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, and it was so big. It's like, what the hell is this? How is this even a thing? I'm having to look up, you know, research on the internet. Like, oh, this kind of stuff grows. And it was like, really, as you can imagine, pretty disgusting. So that was kind of the ew factor <laughs> that I brought into that story. And I wanted it to mean something. So in real life, it's just a fluke. In the story, it has a meaning. It is meant to be a clue of some kind. It's meant to be a communication of some kind, let's say. But that wasn't enough. You can't just have a premise. In order to have a story, you have to have a character who is the best person to interact with your premise. Like, for whom is this the best thing or the worst thing or both that could happen to them? So I came up with the idea of a mother in desperation. And I have a 19-year-old son, but trust me, as a mother, you always have your guilt moments where you wonder, you know, should I have snapped? Should I have spoken to them that way? I wish I had been less afraid for their future and I could have been a calmer, you know, I like, so you're constantly quizzing yourself about how you could have been a better parent. And again, I just turn that up to 11. So just like with the fungus, you turn that up to 11 and make it not just gross, but also supernatural. You turn up that mommy guilt to 11 and imagine what if I had accidentally, quote unquote, broken my son's arm, which is the first line of the story. I broke my daughter's arm, she says. And to really sit with how would that feel? What would that be like? Never mind the legal repercussions of which there have been some, <laughs> <laughs> but the repercussions on your own conscience, it's sort of undoing her to ask, am I that person? I mean, and my mother did worse to me. I mean, she was beating me until I had welts. I've never even spanked my daughter. So it's so unfair to her that her mother has custody of her daughter when her mother was such a terrible parent to her, passing on again, this intergenerational cycle of violence. And so I get to unpack that. And once I had all that together, the communication and what the communication means and the implications of who else might have lived in that rumpus room before she did, all of that was just imagination, sort of dark imagination. And yeah, I do leave the reader to kind of suss it out for themselves. And when I did that story in particular, I was thinking of a, of a story I read. I wish I could think of the title. This is like more than 20 years ago by Joyce Carol Oates, which was a, it was a Christmas horror story. And I don't know how she accomplished this, but by the time they're opening the presents, you're pretty sure there are body parts wrapped up in those presents, right? <laughs> like you don't ever see them open, like they start to open the presents, but she has sort of planted this idea. Oh, this is about to be ugly. These are dismembered body parts. <laughs> and I don't know why, again, I don't remember how she did that, but I wanted to kind of conjure that expectation or a similar expectation, like something really ugly really, really horrible, where it's almost, you know, I can't even do it justice to put it in words for you. So I'm just going to stick this in your head right here. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can tell me what you think is at the real end of that story. Uh -huh. And it is as ugly. In my mind, it is absolutely as ugly as she thinks it is. You know, I think she figured it out. It's like a detective story with a ghost as your partner. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a hell of a story. <laughs> Thank you. Your uh, story migration centers around a woman named Jasmine that has been having problems with what seem to be psychotic episodes since birth. Her Nana performed a ritual that was tantamount to an exorcism when she was a child after Jasmine had tried to set herself on fire. And the house. Don't forget. And, the oh, house. and the house. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think it was just a, it was just lighter fluid all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Um, so, what are your beliefs about possession? Do you believe in possession or would you say that it's the stuff of fiction and that it's organic mental illness? I mean, let's just say I've never encountered anything I thought was a real possession. Although of all the creatures, I may be most frightened of demons because at least sort of zombies are horrifying, but biologically you kind of understand what happened here. There's someone who's dead and now they're undead and they want to kill you. It's very cut and dry. It's painful. It's scary, but you get it. Ghosts very often just want you to know they exist and they want you to know what happened to them. But a demon is so hard to predict 
and so hard to understand and it can actually follow people for generations, right? It just feels like these curses are so hard to shake off and they're so unfair. I mean, it's it, like, it seems to happen for no reason, just like in The Exorcist. Reagan has nothing to do with that expedition. I can't even figure out. Maybe I need to like do some research. Why was she chosen? <laughs> Why was this little girl who had nothing to do with this expedition chosen randomly by this demon? So even though I've never experienced it and don't really believe in it, I did want to write the story from the point of view of someone like exploring what would it feel like if you were nesting something inside of your psyche that wasn't just you. Mm. Yeah, I'm kind of the same as far as I've never really seen anything convincing. It's just strange. Like, I've uh, had experience with people that are schizophrenic in my life, and, you know, I'll see them talking to somebody that's not there. Mm. And, of course, there's no, like, what's an example, a drawer flying open or books flying off the shelf, anything like that, obviously. But it's like, it's just really interesting that from the context of, mental illness that your brain can play those kind of tricks on you. I mean, I can understand people believing in demon possession. It's frightening. And for people who are dealing with actual mental illness and my, I mean, yes, I tried to write the story so you can ask yourself if it's mental illness and you reader may decide it is, you know, it, art is in the eye of the beholder, but I will tell you as the author, <laughs> I did not mean it to be mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, The Good House, my novel, uh, also deals with possession. But I really haven't dealt with much possession since then. And it's actually, I think, one of my scariest, if not my scariest book. We'll see. It's just, I think for parents and families who are actually dealing with mental illness, it might almost be a relief to feel like there's some kind of other explanation. And that if you get some holy water and some incantations, maybe you can fix it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it's no, it can be a real struggle. Yeah. Well, your story, Caretaker, is a strange tale centered around a two-year-old boy named Carson. Strange how? I don't understand what you're talking oh, about. <laughs> well, there's, I have so many questions for you. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a strange tale centered around a two-year-old boy named Carson that somehow survived for 10 days after his mother committed a murder-suicide with his father. The story is very surreal and mixes the malevolence of abuse with the benevolence of a fictional caretaker. So one of the things, and listeners at home, the caretaker, when you read this, it's very original. It's, it's pretty incredible who this caretaker is. But I noticed when referring to Carson and the other victims, you use the word forsaken, which makes sense, obviously. But the word forsaken is italicized and hyphenated. Is there something uh, I was missing? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't really know. I think maybe because this story is mostly from the point of view of a two-year-old, which is not easy, by the way. Mm, yeah. um, so I'm imagining that there are flashes of omniscience to sort of explain what the heck is going on. And maybe I use that capital italicized forsaken because he has uh, absorbed some understanding of his situation from the creature. And it's the creature's job to care for the forsaken. That is what this creature does. So it presents in a very frightening way. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually there for the best of intentions and the best of reasons, even though. <laughs> and, and I will say that uh, Caretaker, I published in Fangoria magazine. And at the time I wrote it, I was already, as with Incident at Bear Creek Lodge, I was already writing a script where that story is the backstory for a contemporary story about another set of characters. So that's the first time we see the creature. But my graphic novel, The Keeper, which came out last year, is the expansion of this idea of the character. And if I could have called it Caretaker, I would have, but um, there was another movie called Caretaker already. And at the time I wrote The Keeper, it was a script and I wanted to try to get it made. So I thought it would probably not be a good idea to use a title that had just come out the year before. <laughs> but uh, so that's why I chose The Keeper instead of Caretaker. But yeah, it's the backstory. It's its own little arc for one person who interacts with this creature and that person happens to be two years old. Okay. 
Well, your story one day only, and I believe at this point we've crossed into another section, which is the Naima stories. Is that how you pronounce her name? Yes. Naima. Okay. Your story one day only is a dystopian tale about a woman named Naima that is desperately trying to find solace during the aftermath of a plague by putting on a one woman comedy show. (laughs) <laughs> you don't read that every day. No, <laughs> I'll read that again. Uh, find <laughs> someone that is desperately trying to find solace during the aftermath of a plague by putting on a one woman comedy show. So uh, COVID was a very difficult time and a lot of people were searching for ways to ease the pain they were feeling. One of the things I remember that I thought was really interesting was how you would think because everybody was not able to work and was worried about money that they would only be spending it like on things necessary for living. But a lot of subscriptions for podcasts went up and and Mm -hmm. anything Mm -hmm. in the arts, people really need the, the arts watch, and entertainment to uh we, yeah we all watch the tiger king you know yeah <laughs> would tiger we do king. that if there had been no covid yeah, heck no yeah. heck no no i can't believe i i spent <laughs> but anyway yeah I, I mean i and i wrote i created the naima character long before covid uh she also appears in my other collection ghost summer i meet her at various points in her life so I'm meeting her in this story actually earlier in her timeline as a younger woman than she appeared in my previous collection, just like little slices of life. And this slice of life is that time she almost had like a loving relationship, you know, mm-hmm. and she had it kind of good for just a, like a little bit, like things are kind of calm. Uh, you you have food, you have water, you have a girlfriend, and she's always wanted to do stand out. And yeah, to your point... We do look for escape during times of crisis. And my version, and I feel like we're kind of always in crisis. So my version of that has always been horror on the one hand and comedy on the other. So I might watch a horror movie every day if I can, some kind of horror. Maybe it's Tubi, whatever, or Shudder. But I also like to listen to stand up every day. Mm -hmm. Both of them are necessary for me. I need both. And a lot of comedians are drawing on their own traumas to make us laugh. So it makes perfect sense to me that she would want to put on a stand-up comedy (laughs) show. I don't know why that sounds so weird. I mean, and she gets to discover by putting on that show that there are more survivors in this area than she thought. And they're eager to hear her jokes, you know? And that was kind of tough because I really wanted the jokes to be super funny. And my editor didn't think, my first editor (laughs) didn't think the jokes were that funny. He's like, well, it makes sense. She's not a professional. But I was like, no, but I want them to be funny. I mean, I think it's on the delivery. So you have to be there. You have to be there. Like when she says, I'd love to go swimming, but I'm more afraid of the lifeguards than the sharks. You know, come on. That's funny because there's a play. Get it? It's infectious. (laughs) Whatever. Everyone's a critic. (laughs) (laughs) Well, as you're speaking, levity is often a good way to find some joy in the midst of turmoil. So is there anything you remember during lockdown that maybe wasn't directly, maybe indirectly related to it that made you laugh that helped bring a little light into the storm? Oh, wow. Let me think. I feel like that it wasn't a central event. It was really just that steady diet of, you know, Kevin Hart's comedy gold mines podcast that he does and the, uh, pop and fortune radio show on Netflix as a joke just every day, every morning without fail. I don't listen every day like I used to, but it was almost a compulsion <laughs> because I loved the little snippets of stand up and I loved hearing comics talk about their process and, Yeah, it would be that. I can't think of anything funny (laughs) that happened (laughs) during all of COVID, really. No, nothing particularly funny. It was always trying to find ways to create my own laughter. Well, circling back to your book, your story, Attachment Disorder, is another dystopian tale about Naima and her daughter, Lottie, who was produced completely in vitro, not even implanted in Naima, just completely in a lab. 
Yeah. So she's in her 60s when when she gets word that she's a, a mom. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that part. <laughs> yeah. And here's your kid, by the way. Here's your four-year-old kid. <laughs> have fun with her. She's yours now. We're done with our experiment, so you can have her now. And she didn't even want to attach, which is why the story is called Attachment Disorder. Gotcha. Uh, in the story where she originally met her daughter, which is in my previous collection, the question is whether she's going to even open the door. You know, sometimes the arc of the story is, are you going to accept the challenge or not? And for various reasons, particularly, well, A, she didn't know she had a kid. She wasn't looking for a kid. She's in her 60s and her health is not good. Uh, she's, <laughs> it's not good 60s. It's like I've lived my whole life either running away from people who blame me for this plague or in a lab by people studying me uh, because of this plague. So she's stiff and she's not doing well. She needs a cane at some point in the story. And she has to decide whether she wants to. And this is the story where she really becomes this child's mother, like where that relationship becomes real and not just a living arrangement, not just something that Naima thinks, oh, maybe this is just temporary. They're trying to find a way to control me. Uh, no, they make the choice that they're going to walk toward each other, but it happens in like pretty horrific circumstances. Okay. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to know, especially with regard to any dystopian story, is I kind of did a little research and I wanted to know when the first dystopian story was. And I think I think it was back in the 1800s, but definitely not with the subject matter that we have now. But from 1984 to Brave New World, at least as early as the 1900s to present day. The future civilization is always portrayed as not only bleak, but involves the complete loss of privacy and freedom. Why mm. do you think that is? Was that just a precedent that was set that people follow or? No, I think we're following the news at this point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> wow, loss of privacy. I mean, think about all the surveillance cameras. Think of all the apps that are inviting us. Hey, give us your face and we'll make a cute avatar for you. Well, who are you giving your face to? And how are they using that information? I think the privacy concerns are probably greater now than they were in early dystopian fiction, and for good reason. And when we look at the issues that Octavia Butler was preoccupied with, like how hierarchy causes strife within humanity, like I said, we're not getting better about that. We're not getting better about that. So there will always be people who have more who want to protect having more, who want to keep workers from having more, for example. Uh, if we want to look at the labor movement, there will always be power collecting at the top and dribbling down to the masses unless the masses notice that this is happening <laughs> and actually do something about it. So I think that these battles only become more, uh, they become sharper when you're in a dystopian future where resources are more scarce and people are even more fearful than they are in our world, look at the way our world is and turn that up to 11 <laughs> in terms of how dangerous that society would be. Well, your story Ghost Ship is one of my favorites because of the beautiful scene you paint towards the end oh. in which the protagonist, a woman named Florida, finds herself alone on the observation deck of a boat. I thought that was a very beautiful scene you painted. Thank you. Especially the, uh, the description of the setting, which I won't give away. It involves the outbreak of a disease on a ship that was very likely caused by the strange creature that Florida was attempting to smuggle. And the resulting terrifying situation of not being allowed to leave a ship because you're being quarantined in place is something that I remember hearing about in the news and is just terrifying in general. And I, mm. I hope I didn't spoil too much with that statement, but I didn't know how else to word it. I mean, it is a little spoilery, but uh, there's more to it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, listeners at home, I apologize. But uh, one of the things that I got from that story is that sometimes freedom is a state of mind. Was that something you were trying to convey? And if not, what was the overarching theme? Huh. Freedom is a state of mind. I think in some ways, yes, actually. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to, to put that because in some ways it's a pretty horrific situation, but in other ways it's like, I've got 
freedom and free time, you know? So let, let me make the most out of that once you can get past the fear. And I, I think that is pretty applicable to a lot of things we experience in life. Changes are scary until we have to sort of resolve ourselves. Okay, well, I guess this is happening now and figure out how to pivot. And that is how people survive. So yeah, this is a character who starts out with things pretty dire. <laughs> and for some readers, it might look dire all the way through the end. But I did want it to feel hopeful. Okay. Well, Shopping Day was another disturbing dystopian tale. And uh, this one involved the monthly trip that a mother made to the supply hubs to get food and medicine for her family. And the trip was held off for once a month because it was so dangerous. And the mother in the story was a great example of intense emotional fortitude. Whether it was facing danger or betrayal, she kept her head up and a smile on her face. And I've met people that have had that level of emotional strength, and I envy them, <laughs> to say the mm. least. What would you say is the common characteristic among people with this sort of emotional and mental resolve? You know, I think it's hidden in most of us is the most common characteristic. Mm. I think that even people who don't think of themselves as strong people, when they look back upon their lives, it's like, how did I ever get through that? The way I look at it is you become someone slightly different, right? So the person you are now probably wouldn't deal that great with a zombie apocalypse. But the person you would become <laughs> while you're in the middle of the zombie apocalypse, I can see you right now with a baseball bat pitted with like all these <laughs> like nails and a helmet mm -hmm. kicking ass, pardon my French, because you have to become that person. You just, you don't have a choice. The circumstances demanded of you. I think we find that in times of grief when loved ones are ill and we look back like, how did I ever get through that? Because it wasn't you. First of all, it was the person you had to become to experience that. And sometimes we feel a, a sense of personal grief because we want to be the old person we were and we're so changed by what we went through. And I think the key is to realize that, yeah, you're changed, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're changed for the worse. It just means that you've lived another experience and you've deepened your sort of repertoire now so that you have some more skills for facing the future. Mm -hmm. And the ending is kind of left up to interpretation. You're trying to figure out whether something very evil was happening or whether it wasn't. And I don't think I've really read anything like that before with an ending that, you know, like in one case, you're letting the reader fill in the details of an ending. Mm -hmm. And in the other, you're presenting them with two options that are equally terrifying. How you can choose to look at the ending, right? Like what yeah. was happening, mm -hmm. what, what, what the mother interrupted. Yeah. Um, I would say that if you even interviewed those characters who were involved in the situation you're talking about, they might not know for sure exactly what they were up to. But I will say this, people do not always act in the best way during a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. There's a movie called His House on Netflix, which is very scary isolation immigration horror which is exactly about this. It's about, yeah, you're refugees. And yeah, we feel sorry for you. But man, sometimes people do things in crisis that haunt them as well. Yeah. Well, your final story in the book, the biographer seemed to be more psychological in nature than the rest of your stories. One of the concepts the story deals with is things in life that you regret. And no one is guaranteed the next second in life. It can be taken from us on a whim. And uh, Henry David Thoreau said that most people lead lives of quiet desperation. And you have accomplished so much in your life. What is the secret to achieve your dreams and goals in spite of all the responsibilities and stresses in life? I think having a single-minded focus is so helpful. Not single-minded, but single-minded enough. I had a stepdaughter who's in her mid-30s now, and I've co-raised our son who's 19 and I have a, a marriage and I have family and I have a father, you know, who's aging. So I have a lot of life outside of my own dreams. But when it comes to my dreams, I have held fast to them. I knew very early I wanted to be a writer 
And it really helped me as a high school student, as a college student, to sort of filter out things that were not going to take me to that, <laughs> you know, and maybe maybe some things I could have pursued more. Yeah, Maybe I will circle back to music and circle back to comedy even. I did an open mic night once. Um, nice. But right now, it's all about uh, prose and it's all about screenplays. And we just have a podcast coming out again, best of life writing, because we do a podcast called Life Writing Right for Your Life, which is about this whole thing about how do you do that? How do you have a balanced artist life while you pursue your dreams? And this particular episode coming up is about surviving rejection and disappointment. And that is number one, because if you crumble after rejection and say, ah, oh, well, I'm not going to try that again. Well, no, you're not going to publish that novel. No, you're not going to sell that script. That's you deciding the ending to that story. But when you have an understanding that the arts is full of rejection and did I want The Keeper to be a movie? Sure I did, but it has a different life as a graphic novel. So that experience has taught me that writing scripts in particular, which can feel so much like shouting into a void because no one will ever see it for the most part. No one will ever see most scripts except you and maybe a couple people you asked to read it. And that is not a satisfying thought. <laughs> okay, <Yeah. laughs> But if you look at it as, A, it's a learning exercise. I'm learning how to be a better screenwriter. And B, I have no idea where this might land. I have no idea. So you write out of this sense of faith and because it's who you are and what you do. And that has served me very well. Awesome. Well, you have a bachelor's degree in journalism from Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism and a master's in English literature with an emphasis on Nigerian literature from the University of Leeds. So what attracted you to the written word? I grew up in a house full of books and I grew up with a mother who was a storyteller. And a dad who was always scribbling on his legal pads, mm -hmm. scribbling his ideas and his thoughts and his plans. So between those three things, mm -hmm. <laughs> it just felt natural to express through stories. And I think that oral storytelling tradition that my mother practiced, where she told us the same stories about her civil rights engagement, the episodes, getting tear gas, the people she knew who went to jail over and over and over again. I didn't appreciate it so much when I was a kid. It's like, okay, yeah, I've heard that one. <laughs> but now I get what she was doing. She was imprinting the experience and she was showing me the power of retelling history. And that is something that as a theme comes up in a lot of my work, the retelling of history. And that's actually kind of what the biographer is about. I first started trying to write a story called The Biographer in my early 20s back during that era when I was still writing sort of generic protagonists. You know, it was probably a generic white man or woman, no race in the story. <laughs> and the whole premise back then was just there's a society where when you reach a certain level of importance, you're automatically assigned a biographer. And there's a society of biographers and they have their own sort of weird rules. But I never knew what to do with the story because I hadn't lived enough life. I didn't understand where the story was headed. And even as I was writing the story, it started to head in much darker places than I expected it to. And in total, it is a story about storytelling because the way we talk about people's lives, the way we remember history is storytelling. And sometimes it's true-ish <laughs> and sometimes it's not true at all. It's a myth. But a myth can also have its own value. But the dangerous part is when you don't know the difference between myth and reality. And what is reality anyway? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with a background in journalism, what attracted you to fiction, specifically horror? I always wanted to write fiction. I was still learning I wanted to write horror. I wouldn't figure that out until after college, but I only studied journalism because I needed to satisfy my parents and my own fears that I needed a, a stable job. Kind of funny when you look back on it now. But when I was in college, that was considered a very stable field. So you could spend your entire career working at a newspaper and retire from that newspaper, which is very different now. But I was sort of a reluctant journalist. I'm very grateful for the 10 years I spent working for the Miami Herald, but also I could not wait to not be doing that. I could not <laughs> wait to be out writing full time. So really it was more 
the other way around. It was wanting to be a writer was what sent me into journalism. Mm. Well, you teach a course at UCLA called The Sunken Place, Racism, Survival, and the Black Horror Aesthetic, which focuses on the Jordan Peele film, Get Out. So could you tell us a little bit about that course and tell us maybe about the experience of having Jordan Peele as a guest lecturer? Oh, it's so weird because I was just on Instagram yesterday and randomly Jordan Peele's production company, Monkey Pop Productions, was doing a throwback Thursday tribute to that visit. Oh, really? Several photographs and a picture of me with him that I don't even use that often because I want to be respectful of his privacy and not make it seem like we're like hanging out, (laughs) (laughs) you know, all the time. But um, it was, yeah, it was pretty amazing. First of all, it starts with Get Out, but the course is really more like the documentary Horror Noir. It's about a history of Black horror, but it's using Get Out as kind of that linchpin, as Get Out did in real life for that documentary, to get it sold, to help people understand what Black horror is and where it came from. And a lot of Black horror is just like any horror, but in some cases it has the added sensibility of sort of ancestors and ritual and magic and racism as the monster and, you know, basically fighting tropes, like the tropes that we see in horror movies discussed in horror noir, like the first to die, the sacrificial Negro, the magical Negro, where your only point in the story is to give magical advice to the white characters, sometimes at your own peril or death. But you got, oh, one more thing you got, you know, (laughs) just like, why are you doing that? That does not match human behavior. That is not a real person. So a lot of Black horror is just about making these characters real people. And when Get Out came out, I was super excited and wanted to have an opportunity to teach this history of Black horror, why I love writing horror and why these filmmakers love making horror. And I was, you know, tweeting about it pretty incessantly. A reporter wrote a story about it for io9. Monkey Pop Productions, his company, followed me and I literally just DM'd. And was like, oh, it'd be great if Jordan Peele could come to my class. Because I'm at the age now where I'm not as shy as <laughs> once I was. So I'll just come right out with it. And within two hours, he had responded personally, wow. or his account at least, had responded personally saying, ha ha, I could surprise them. And within two or three weeks later, that's exactly what, what happened. It was a surprise? They didn't know it, it was It was com- a surprise. Whoa. That was what made it so great. Whoa. Uh, it, it could not have been more perfect <laughs> because I had primed them up for weeks, not just watching Get Out, but looking at some stories that predated Get Out. Like there's a story by a well-known Black scholar named W.E.B. Du Bois. Most people don't even know he wrote horror science fiction stories. He wrote a story called The Comet, published in 1920 about a post-apocalyptic event where the only survivors were a Black man and a white woman. And then we look at clips from Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. You know, this whole idea of the interracial relationships that are kind of the underpinning of Get Out and how Peel is kind of flipping the fear of Black male masculinity that still persists in making him innocent. And it's actually the family that is the monster, right? (laughs) So there was all this like real intellectual prep. And so when he showed up in the classroom, it wasn't just, oh, it's Jordan Peele who did this movie and he was on Key and Peele. They really had put him on this pedestal. And they went absolutely nuts when he walked through the door. It was a beautiful thing. My husband, Steve, helped me plan it while we were in a like sort of a little green room when he first arrived in a hoodie and a baseball cap, (laughs) kind of hidden. And we came up with a bit. So I like to say I've officially done a bit with Jordan Peele (laughs) where he was sitting in the back, lights are off. I'm showing the film, the scene where Rose, the white girlfriend, takes the car keys and dangles them and says, you know, you're not getting these keys back, babe, Mm -hmm. which is a a huge turning point for the audience and get out. Spoiler, uh, if Mm -hmm. you haven't seen it, but shame on you. Um, And (laughs) the class is all animated, talking to the screen, all upset. I turn up the lights and say, does anyone have any thoughts about what the director is saying about the coveting of Black bodies? And Jordan Peele raised his hand and stood up and boom, it was, the surprise was on. They were stunned. One girl walked out of the room crying like the Beatles had taken the stage in the 60s. It was, it was really quite something. And um, please tell me nobody was sick that day. 
uh, I'm sure some people were sick. Oh. One student actually walked in late. She oh. didn't know because it was, just, she literally walked right in front of him when she walked in and he actually commented about it. <laughs> so, uh, that was hysterical. And he's been back twice since then. Oh, okay. And he also made an appearance on the online version of the course I created just for the public who are not at UCLA, which I will take the liberty of plugging here, which is www.sunkenplaceclass. Dot com, okay. which is a history of black horror. It also has the interview back then it was Skype <laughs> with Jordan <laughs> Peele, but it really unpacks some of these themes, some of these tropes and the things that black horror artists are trying to accomplish. Well, one more question for you. I know you're a very busy woman. What advice would you give to an aspiring writer that has come down with a severe case of imposter syndrome? <laughs> well, all writers have that. So, I mean, you're in good company if that helps. <laughs> At a certain point, it really just does become about a practice. If you have a practice, it really doesn't matter where your head is. <laughs> you know, you, like I'm having the best time working on this script right now. Like I can barely stop working on it. I was even using the app on my phone the other night when I'm sitting at a, an auditorium working on it. But when I first started, it was like pulling teeth. It's like typing. It's no fun at all. And you have to be able to weather those periods of feeling like you're no good, feeling like you can't write. And just do at least a sentence a day. That's what we teach in our life writing program that we talk about on our podcast. If you have a practice, starting with the basic of a sentence a day, you can't feel like you're so much of an imposter that you can't write a sentence a day. And the trick of it is, if you can make yourself actually sit down and write that sentence a day, eventually you're going to be writing more than one sentence. Probably the first time you do it, you'll be writing more than one sentence. Or you look over what you did yesterday and you realize, oh my God, that doesn't suck as much as I thought it did. Or... If it does suck, you think of a way to fix it so it doesn't suck. And <laughs> if you have a practice, whether it's five days a week, if you don't want to work on weekends or whatever it is, having a practice trumps everything else. Just to be writing. That's what a writer is, someone who writes. The publishing part, you know, there's a research component. There's giving your manuscripts to friends or people in a writer's group to read, there are a lot of steps. Submitting is a very important step. You have to move beyond that. But it all begins with a practice. Without a practice, there is no chance that you can overcome imposter syndrome. Gotcha. Well, Tanana Reeve, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Great talking to you, too. So as we bring the show to a close, is there anything you'd like to plug or let your readers know about? I have a new novel called The Reformatory coming out in October, which is set in the same fictitious town of Gracetown, where some of these short stories are set in the wishing pool. And for people who just want to stay in touch with me, hear what's going on, get tips for writing, you can join my email list at www.tananarivelist.com. <laughs> if you can spell that, it's Tanana like banana with a T, R-I-V-E, list.com. Oh, I will definitely put that in the uh, description. So listeners at home, as I said, all links will be in the description. And Tanana Reeve, thank you again for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to sign up for the podcast newsletter by clicking the link in the description. Be sure to join me next Tuesday, where my guest will be a filmmaker that blends the real-life horror of an historical slaughter with the fictional horror of a skilled writer-director. Until then, stay healthy, stay sane, and as always, thank you for listening. See you next time.
like a flimsy scar Running a case for hearts Tearing myself apart While well, I'm just trying to keep it cool I'm acting like a fool I've got to make it cool What am I gonna do? 